Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 14, verses 1 through 6, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when he was to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him up? And they could not reply to these things. This is the word of the Lord. Let us mark in this passage how our Lord Jesus Christ accepted the hospitality of those who were not his disciples. We read that he went into the house of one of the chief priests to eat bread. We cannot reasonably suppose that this Pharisee was a friend of Christ. It is more probable that he only did what was customary for a man in his position. He saw a stranger teaching religion, some whom regarded as a prophet, and he invited him to eat at his table. The point that concerns us is this, that when the invitation was given, it was accepted. If we want to know how our Lord carried himself at the Pharisee's table, we have only to read attentively the first 24 verses of this chapter. We shall find him the same there that he was elsewhere, always about his father's business. We shall see him first defending the true observance of the Sabbath day, then expounding the nature of true humility, then urging on his host the character of true hospitality, and finally delivering that most relevant and striking parable, the parable of the Great Supper. And all this is done in the most wise and calm and dignified manner. The words are all words in season. The speech is always with grace, seasoned with salt. Colossians 4, six, The perfection of our Lord's conduct appears on this as on all other occasions. He always said the right thing, at the right time, and in the right way. He never forgot for a moment who he was and where he was. The example of Christ in this passage deserves the close attention of all Christians and is specifically on ministers of the gospel. It throws strong light on some most difficult points our communion with unconverted people, the extent to which we should carry it, the manner in which we should behave when we are with them. Our Lord has left us a pattern for our conduct in this chapter. It will be our wisdom to endeavor to walk in his steps. We ought not to withdraw entirely from all communion with unconverted people. It would be cowardice and indolence to do so, even if it were possible. It would shut us out from many opportunities of doing good. But we ought to go into their society moderately, watchfully, and prayerfully, and with a firm resolution to carry our master and our master's business with us. The house from which Christ is deliberately excluded is not the house at which Christians ought to receive hospitalities and keep up intimacy. The extent to which we should carry our communion with the unconverted is a point which every believer must settle for himself. Some can go much further than others in this direction with advantage to their company, and without injury to themselves. Every man has his proper gift. 1 Corinthians 7.7 7. There are two questions which we should often put to ourselves in reference to this subject. Do I, in company, spend all my time in light and worldly conversation? Or do I endeavor to follow, however feebly, the example of Christ? The society in which we cannot answer these questions satisfactorily a society from which we had better withdraw. So long as we go into company as Christ went to the Pharisee's house, we shall take no harm. Let us mark, secondly, in this passage, how our Lord was watched by his enemies. We read that when he went to eat bread on the Sabbath day in the house of a Pharisee, they watched him. The circumstance here recorded is only a type of what our Lord was constantly subjected to all through his earthly ministry. The eyes of his enemies were continually observing him. They watched for his halting and waiting eagerly for some word or deed on which 
they could lay hold and build an accusation. Yet they found none. Our blessed Lord was ever holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from evil. Perfect indeed must that life have been in which the bitterest enemies could find no flaw or blemish or spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He that desires to serve Christ must make up his mind to be watched and observed no less than his master. He must never forget that the eyes of the world are upon him and that the wicked are looking narrowly to all his ways. Specifically ought he to remember this when he goes into the society of the unconverted. If he makes a slip there, in word or deed, or acts inconsistently, he may rest assured it will not be forgotten. Let us endeavor to live daily as in the sight of a holy God. So living, it will matter little how much we are watched by an ill-natured and malicious world. Let us exercise ourselves to have a conscious void of offense toward God and man, and to do nothing which can give occasion to the Lord's enemies to blaspheme. The thing is possible. By the grace of God, it can be done. The haters of Daniel were obliged to confess, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel 6, verse 5. Let us mark lastly in this passage how our Lord asserts the lawfulness of doing works of mercy on the Sabbath. We read that he healed a man who had dropsy on the Sabbath day, and that he said to the lawyers and Pharisees, Which of you shall have a donkey or an ox fall into a pit and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? This was a home thrust which could not be offended off. It is written, they could not answer him. The qualification which our Lord here puts on the requirement of the fourth commandment is evidently founded in scripture, reason, and common sense. The Sabbath was made for man, for his benefit, not for his injury, for his advantage, not for his hurt. The interpretation of God's law respecting the Sabbath was never intended to be strained so far as to interfere with charity, kindness, and the real needs of human nature. All such interpretations only defeat their own end. They require that which fallen man cannot perform, and thus bring the whole commandment into disrepute. Our Lord saw this clearly and labored throughout his ministry to restore his precious part of God's law to its just position. The principle which our Lord lays down about Sabbath observance needs careful fencing with cautions. The right to do works of necessity and mercy is fearfully abused in these latter days. Thousands of Christians appear to have trampled down the hedge and burst the bounds entirely with respect to the holy day. They seem to forget that though our Lord repeatedly exclaims the requirement of the fourth commandment, he never struck it out of the law of God or said it was not binding on Christians at all. Can anyone say that Sunday traveling, except on very rare emergencies, is a work of a mercy? Will anyone tell us that Sunday trading, Sunday dinner parties, Sunday excursion trains on railways, Sunday deliveries of letters and newspapers are works of mercy? Have servants and shopmen and engine drivers and coachmen and clerks and porters no souls? Do they not need rest for their bodies and time for their souls like other men? These are serious questions and ought to make many people think. Whatever others do, let us resolve to keep the Sabbath holy. God has a controversy within the churches about Sabbath desecration. It is a sin of which the cry goes up to heaven, and we reckoned for one day. Let us watch our hands of this sin and have nothing to do with it. If others are determined to rob God and take possession of the Lord's day for their own selfish ends, let us not be partakers in their sins. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, Ryle encourages us to follow Christ's example of being in the lives of unbelievers, yet with intention. He challenges us to enter into such situations moderately, watchfully, and prayerfully so that we are being light to those around us and not the other way around. When in such situations, are we at very least praying for a door to be opened for the word to be shared? Are there situations we should avoid because we're unable to be a light there? Second, as Christians, we are to be the fragrance of Christ the world around us, 
so we should not be surprised that the world is watching us. Are we living in such a way that not only do those around us know we're Christians, but that we are faithful witnesses of him? And lastly, what is your view of the Sabbath command under the new covenant? Whether you are convinced by Ryle's arguments or not regarding the Sabbath, it is not an option to have no view at all.